Millions of people rely directly on glacial meltwater for survival. But due to climate change, these reservoirs in the sky are disappearing at an alarming rate. Some scientists have predicted that by the end of the century, much of the Himalayas could be practically ice-free. Here in Ladakh, which experiences only 50 millimeters of annual rainfall, glaciers have been the life source for centuries. But due to climate change, over 14% of the local glaciated area has been lost in the last 50 years. I'm here to visit an engineer who's come up with a beautiful and extraordinary way of preserving the glacial water using monuments made of ice. In the town of Lei, I meet Sewang Dolme, a local environmental scientist. I understand that you are a bit of an expert about uh, climate change and the effects on mountain communities. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a sense of some of the challenges that they're facing here in Lei? The main crisis is that you have a carbon mm -hmm. glacier. Is that what we can see yeah, right yeah, there? Yeah, that's carbon wow. glacier. And that's where 80% of the water is coming for the Lei residents. And that glacier is receding at a very fast rate. And every family in Leh has a guest house, and uh, they drain groundwater like anything. If there is no glacier water to recharge the groundwater, then of course there will be water crisis. You will see people, you know, fighting over water. Literally. Yeah, literally. The situation is getting worse by the day. Almost a billion people are affected by shrinking glaciers throughout the Himalayas. In nearby village Fiang, farmers are on the front line. Sonam Dolma and Funchuk Anchuk have been working here for more than 40 years. Thank you. Oh, Sonam, thank you so much. Thank you, Chili. Okay, so cheers. Have you noticed any changes, perhaps with the seasons or with the levels of water? <laughs> here in the region of Ladakh, the population relies heavily on the Indus River. But with the situation getting dramatically worse, a local engineer, Son Nam Wanchuk, has stepped up to the challenge of helping the villagers adapt to these changes. In January, February, nobody needs water, so the streams flow and go into the Indus and into the ocean. Whereas in April, May, everybody, all plants, all humans are all dying for water. Yeah? And then there's acute shortage of water. What ice stupa does is by using winter water, storing it in the form of ice, and it melts exactly when there's this acute shortage. That spring problem is solved using winter water into ice that melts in spring, and then you're set. At the Environmental Mountain School he founded in 1988, Sonam has been refining and teaching his ice stupa concept for the last two years. Way, the pipe brings water, and then it falls down and becomes a stupa, right? You know, next 40, 50 years, the people who will be running this world are now in schools and colleges. I want to engage them in these uh, innovative ways to be sensitive towards the environment in the mountains so that then the earth could be in safe hands. And before we go to the ice topa, we'll see a little demonstration of how it is formed. Huh? Now that, suppose, is the mountain. Hmm? And that bucket there, is say the stream. From the lake or the stream, water comes in the pipe, which is underground, but here you can see, and there's pressure in the pipe. And then it comes like this. So you can see small droplets 
which means water is exposed to the minus 20, minus 30 air, loses its heat and freezes. There is no moving part, there is no electricity, just gravity. That's the beauty of it. Good. Thank you. We're heading up to the ice stupas further up in the mountains, but first we have to make a quick stop. Okay, what have we got into here? They use these for the ice stupas to help the ice form. So this is a kind of vital part. It's like the skeleton of the stupa, if you like. I'll go and give them a hand, right? One, two, three. <laughs> Uh, okay. It's my contribution. <laughs> there it is. Wow. Never seen anything like that before. This is, huh? <laughs> now I understand, you know? It's quite, an, oh, it's a bonkers idea. It's quite, it's quite crazy, really. <laughs> the design of the stupa is critical for its success. It must have a minimal surface area to provide a maximum protection from the sun. This enables it to last long into spring, sometimes up to four months. If the same volume of ice was a flat glacier, it would melt within days. One, two. Ugh. This dude's climbed the top with his crampons and ice axe, and he's thrown down this rope, and he's just pulling them up piece by piece and just adding them to the pile. The prickly buckthorn is added all the way to the top of the stupa. The water catches onto the thorns, making it easier to crystallize in the cold weather. And when you see the size of it, you really understand how that could have a a significant impact mm -hmm. for irrigation. Mm -hmm. but what do you reckon the volume of water is there? Two million litres. Two, mm -hmm. Two million litres, yes. At the bottom of that tunnel, really in the heart of the ice stupa, is this large pipe. And that's the one that's channeling the meltwater down from the glacier up on the mountain coming down to the base of that pipe, and because of that head of pressure, it's forcing it 15 or 20 meters up into the air and psh, out into a sprinkler to coat the outer structure. It's quite spooky in there. <laughs> Sonam's vision isn't just about a handful of ice stupas in one mountain village, but hundreds of them, protecting the entire Himalayas and helping irrigate fields and forests. 5,000 trees were planted in 2015 and are irrigated each spring with the water harvested from the ice stupas. He's already won global recognition for this project. What's the future for these guys? Where do you okay. see these going in the next few years? I see it going in two different directions. Lower and lower towards the people in the villages. Higher and higher towards the highest parts of the valley where you can grow many of them, chains of them. So our hope is we could re-glaciate what we have lost to buy time and adapt to changing climate. So we've just lost the sun over the hill there. It's getting cold very quickly, but we've got a plan. We've got Stanson and Thomas here, and they've uh, brought some prayer flags to tie up onto the top of these two ice stupas, and we'll get a sense tomorrow morning how effective they are at creating these amazing structures. The water in the pipe is released overnight when temperatures reach minus 20 or minus 30 degrees. Oh, here it comes! Ah! Slowly building up these structures until they reach heights of 60 or 70 feet. Yeah! It's like an uh, oil rig. Yeah. It's like you've struck oil, <laughs> but you've struck water, eh? The 
next morning, I return to the stupas to see the changes that have happened overnight. Oh, wow. Oh, man, look at that. That is fantastic, isn't it? Let me go and see. I want to climb up it, but I don't know if that's a good idea. Let's see. If I get stuck, I'm going to make quite a nice addition to this sculpture. I'm just thinking they're going to come back tomorrow and find me in here. <laughs> Bearing in mind the whole reason that they're doing this is to try and conserve that winter meltwater. It's like a kind of water battery. They charge it up in the winter and then it melts in the spring. We are losing our glaciers almost for no fault of ours. Life would not have been possible at all in this desert had it not been for those glaciers. Yeah? Because it had this fossilized water from tens of thousands of years ago, we are able to survive. Mm. And if they are gone, we'll be gone. And it will be a real desert mm. with no life. Mm. People in big cities, if they lived simply, then people in the mountains mm. could simply live. Yeah? Mm. And uh, sooner or later, it will come to their own uh, doorsteps. Mm. So we should be sensitive to see the first signs mm. and mend our ways. Mm.